Price. That's the number one technical indicator. You do best by investing for the longer term. If you can't explain what the business is doing, then that is a huge red flag. Some technological change is going to put you out of business. It really is a genuinely extraordinary situation. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Ed Gotham, and welcome to another episode of Opto Sessions where we interview the top traders and investors from around the world, uncovering their secrets to success. This week, I'm delighted to introduce Jamie Rogozinski, founder of the notorious Wall Street Bets subreddit. You'll all know them from the infamous GameStop short squeeze, a moment that will go down in history alongside the rise of the retail trader and the power of communities. Jamie founded Wall Street Bets, a movement for financial democracy, in 2012, and the community currently stands at approximately 11 million strong. In this interview, we discuss why Jamie founded Wall Street Bets, how the GameStop story unfolded, the power of communities, NFTs, and we're also going to detail on a number of innovative DeFi features from the new Wall Street Bets decentralized app, such as high yield liquidity pools and exchange traded portfolios. Enjoy. Jamie, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. Yes, thank you very much for having me. I've been looking forward to this for quite some time, so I'm really, really interested to dig into the, the questions today. Um, I thought we could start with debunking some Wall Street Bets terminology. I think quite a few people on the podcast or listeners will, will know these already, but it's good to hear it just you know, quickly from your point of view anyway. Um, so we might start with paper hands and diamond hands. I thought you could just give us a bit of insight into that. Paper hands and diamond hands. <laughs> so these are terms uh, that were, I guess, I don't know exactly where they came from, but they make reference to people that are going to buy something and hold it, regardless of how uh, <laughs> the volatility is affecting it. And paper hands is someone that gives up early and then decides to sell, right? And like the idea behind this is you know, a lot of people that buy something and just hold on to it for dear life, uh, that's going to help appreciate the value of that particular asset, whatever it might be. Yeah, cool. Um, HODL? HODL, all right. So similar thing, that one did start in the in the blockchain world and the crypto world. It is, I believe it started from like a misspelling. So it just means just hold on to it, right? Like Bitcoin's had the craziest volatility in the universe and uh, people that were able to HODL properly ended up uh, doing quite well. And to the moon, which might have also started from crypto, maybe, but um, definitely picked up massively in the Wall Street bets community. Yeah, um, I think that was kind of like, like an inherent one, right? Whenever yeah. somebody wants to just like, that's just a really simple thing to go to. Uh, to the moon, same thing. Let's make the price of this go up, right? So these things all kind of synergize to each other. If you hold something with diamond hands, it goes to the moon and, and boom, everyone makes money. Cool. And then eight strong together is the last one I did. It's just this concept that if you have, instead of having, you know, these these really sophisticated hedge fund model, whatever, using a high frequency, anything, it's just like, dude, if we have enough people come together that don't necessarily need to be the most sophisticated, but we can, we can do great things if we, if we unite. Awesome. And what exactly is Wall Street Bets to you? I think, it, you know, it'd be interesting to hear from your point of view what, what it is. I mean, what it is now, like it's transcended to, to this idea, you know, it starts off as a, as a forum, a, a subreddit where people come together and talk about different risky strategies or try to find various relatively sophisticated ARB opportunities uh, that are crowdsourced through the mechanism of the internet. And, and it's now become this kind of omnipresent philosophy, right? That, that lives not, not just on Reddit, on Wall Street, but subreddit, but like there's a bunch of offshoots that are more specific to different asset classes or locations like Korea Street Bets or Silver Street Bets or Satoshi Street Bets. Yeah. Uh, but outside of Reddit too, you have Telegram, Discord, Facebook, you know, all these things. And, and but people, it, it now represents this, hey, let's become empowered. Let's democratize uh, finance. Let's take control of our own, uh, you know, future, and 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 uh, not necessarily just rely on the man or these institutional or governmental agencies to to do the decisions for us. Yep. So it's essentially a, a community with some values that the community is behind and they adhere to, sort of thing. That's exactly right. And initially, why did you found Wall Street Bets? Like, where, how did that come about? So it was this 
combination of, of, of a couple of things. Number one, at the time I'm single, I have a good job. It's leaving me a disposable income, right? But I have this good job after having lost my previous one to the financial crisis. Uh, but I have extra money laying around every month and decide to say, hey, I'm never going to be able to, to become Warren Buffett with a you know, thousand bucks or whatever I have to spare. But I could potentially win the lottery, right? Or I could potentially take some bigger chances and be able to turn this thing into, into more money and, and get myself more empowered. Right. So that's one philosophy and it, and it juxtaposed, it's juxtaposed uh, next to this kind of philosophy that wall street is kind of broken, right? Let's try and fix it by breaking it. Or if you can't beat them, join them and, and, and exploit or find exploits or inefficiencies or, or profit making opportunities that may be missed or may not be readily apparent to these larger institutions that use more sophisticated efforts. Yep. And what started as somewhere to discuss these bets or, or, you know, big, big like payoff bets then sort of transitioned into more of like the almost behind this democratization of finance. Is that sort of fair to say? Yeah. You know, like there's this entire movement that's going in parallel, right? Like you have wall street bets, which is this, let's call it a community of people that are like-minded individuals that want to uh, just democratize, you know, we see it in finance, but we see it in everything. We see it with information. We see, and we've seen this for, for quite some time. It's a trend that's there and it gets accompanied by uh, the tools with which to do that. Like brokers that start becoming low commissioned and eventually non-commissioned like free uh, for trading and then the, the reduction of the uh, barriers of entry in the form of capital requirements, because you have fractional shares, people can just, buy little bits of a share if they can't afford the whole thing. And so now there's no minimum requirements. Mm. Now there's just free trading and easy interface. You don't need to understand discounted cash flows to, to buy shares or don't need to understand black shows to trade stock options and just like answer with an arrow. And, and this, so the, the, this accompanies and it goes together in unison and largely pushed by this generation or generations of people that were affected directly or indirectly by the, the financial crisis and have been off put by it. So this energy that we see, once again, not just in finance, but you see it everywhere. This idea of shared economies, you start seeing um, you know, Uber and Airbnb, all these concepts of maximization of uh, resources and gig economies. And let's do these things in a way that I can actually improve my own situation. Yeah. And you, um, you recently released a book as well. And the title was How, How Boomers Made the World's Biggest Casino for Millennials. How does that tie in to Wall Street bets? Like, could you explain that a bit more? Yeah. So, you know, like I've been witnessing this phenomenon take place over the past 10 years, these kind of gradual changes, but also this, this massive shift slowly setting up and brewing. All these recipe ingredients are, are coming together. And so the book's main point is to explore these high level trends of what happened, you know, starts with the financial crisis and what happens to this whole generation of younger individuals, millennials, Gen Zs, you know, how do they get affected, how they are worse off than their older generations were at this particular point in time and takes and, and, and walks you through the various components of this democratization that I'm saying, this mindset that you have, this availability for finding cheat codes and free access of information and, and how th these generations have now been able to carve out a niche for themselves in this own in the market so that they can be participants in their own way without necessarily conforming to the traditional way of, of using Wall Street. And it ties into Wall Street bets because I use stories in an entertaining fashion taken directly from Wall Street bets of individuals that did crazy things, right? Took insane amounts of risk or found you know, got really lucky without understanding and turning, you know, a little bit of money into fortunes or, or losing yes. fortunes just from being either whatever it might be. And it's a really entertaining kind of a company uh, sideline to, to explore all these different topics. And what value do people derive from being a part of the community? Is it the, the shared values thing that's the most important thing? Or is it, is it these opportunities, which is essentially how you started it? Is discussing these potential opportunities for for millennials, let's say, uh, to you know potentially get rich. These like casino bets. So I, you know, humans are tribal in nature. Human humans crave communities, and you'll see it 
with anything, you know, with political affiliation to sports teams, to hobbies, you know, you like mountain climbing or art or book clubs, whatever it is, it's, it's people like to, to belong and to be able to hang out and discuss whatever things are, are interesting to them. So on one hand, they like it because it's a community with, with like-minded individuals. And number two, it's like a very genuine community, right? Yes, everyone is is hoping to make money. There, there's cases where people actually just <laughs> appear to do it for the, uh, either for the fun or for the, yeah. uh, you know, the advocate movement, and they're trying to actually be, you know, push this philosophical idea forward. But the majority of people just want to make some money, right? Or hopefully make a lot of money. And and so you have these like-minded individuals hoping to make money. You collectively use the power of the internet and these different algorithms of social media to try and give visibility to to ideas or individuals that that have noteworthy. Um, ideas or memes to share or whatever it might be. And this can be just special because it's like just brutally honest and real. One of the things that sets Wall Street bets aside from other investing type communities is their propensity to discuss losses yeah. openly. You know, sometimes people think, oh, they're celebrating it. They think it's funny. And like, no, they actually don't think it's funny. No, nobody thinks it's good to lose money. Not the people that are posting their loss and not the people that are kind of jokingly giving them this camaraderie, this, this, uh, this playful teasing that you see with siblings all the time mm-hmm. to try and say, no, dude, it's cool. I, I get it. Um, you know, you lost money. You were either an idiot or that's really funny or you should have done this next time. And and it makes it real, right? Because this individual actually is sharing the outcome. And it also gives insight into the reality of what this, what participating in the stock market looks like. It's so easy to find examples of people that only show the great aspects of it. Look how much money I made or look how much stuff I bought. And it's not the full picture. The full picture is like these people lose money too. And this is great. People embrace that reality and that genuine interaction. Yeah, no, definitely. I I see obviously um fintwit uh, what they call that the, the financial stuff on twitter is big as well and and um you, you definitely don't see as many people being honest about the losses and stuff uh as much as like how open it is on on wall street bets and but from the outside looking in for many people who don't know much about it wall street bets you know it appears it was it's just promoting high stakes like gambling but what we're sort of saying is that as actually there actually is some real really valuable education and it's just their way of sort of going through that because it's not, a, you know, the stock market is not an easy game to play. And I mean, yeah, like, look, I mean, the stock market at its core is, is in a sense, gambling in the sense of speculating, yeah. right? Like for the longest time, the word speculator was the actual word for trader. And it, it still is the word in, in other languages um, because you're just guessing. Even investors are still kind of guessing. They're taking educated guesses yeah. and, and they're hoping to get the outcome that they're getting for. So the embracing the language around gambling openly as opposed to try and masquerade behind sophisticated, oh, this is discounted cash flows according to the, you know, whatever. It's just, dude, I think the stock's going to go up because I like the car, right? And, and, and you'll get sometimes more sophisticated things, but sometimes even simple <laughs> concepts like, hey, stocks only go up. Like, yeah, it seems really primitive, but it's also true, <laughs> right? It pisses <laughs> off pisses off CNBC and all the people that work on, on these, you know, advanced degrees and on this stuff because they don't always go up but but they do right even even the the great depression where much just stocks are really high up from then so it's using that simplicity to to be able to reach and and, and make it more attainable and digestible to the average audience it's like yeah dude i'm going to bet on this money i'm not going to use the word invest I could use that word invest, but but I'm going to use the word bet because it seems more appropriate. People can relate to it and it's more fun and it takes some of the dry aspects away from it. And, but, but the sophistication is there. I mean, the people come up with really, even the short squeeze uh, with GameStop, which is what it, people most um, know Wall Street bets most commonly for, was extremely sophisticated. It was not a short squeeze where people just buy the stock, right? Like you can, they could not have done that with a different stock like Apple if, you know, conditions were somewhat similar. They did it because it was like this pinpoint precision and people, you can see the posts of people being very calculated ahead of time, explaining what these factors are and how exactly this maneuver is going to work. And it involved all sorts of really interesting stuff and obviously some luck and then fueled by the media. But but there's there's a lot of intelligence behind it. Sa- same thing happened right before that when, or not right before, but maybe a year before when people were uh, taking advantage of this this uh, Robinhood glitch and they were taking out like infinite margin. They could get unlimited buying power, you know. And before that's a similar variation of that using box spreads, which is like a sophisticated yeah, arbitrage, yeah. right? Like stock options, box spreads are not 
easy. <laughs> now, if you Google it, there's a reference to Wall Street bets. <laughs> It's incredible. So these are these cheats. Is this what you're the sort of things that they're finding to they're cheat codes? Yeah, and people like cheat codes. That's the thing. Is this this younger generation also, you know, they like the video games and they like to find their little shortcuts and you see it with with all sorts of things. Like people figure out a cheat code for Chipotle to see if they can get their free block with that extra yeah. money or whatever, you know, like it's just this mentality, but the language that reflects it. It's like I'm gonna get this little shortcut and uh and it's going to give me just this tiny little bit of edge. And and it's the same thing with the market. It's this game and they can find these little <laughs> opportunities and they share them and they grow them and they expand upon them. Yeah. And just taking back to GameStop as well, um a lot of people probably don't know like and you talk about the sophistication behind it. It wasn't just like a random stock they they chose. I found it very interesting that one of the reasons that it began gaining traction was the because of uh, Ryan Cohen, founder of um the you know, pet ecom giant Chewy and you know a few of their other uh, high high up employees joined as directors and uh, you know promising a story of transformation after you know they'd had uh, profit warnings and stuff like this as classic sort of you know, um, decline of a company that was brick and mortar and hadn't adapted well to e-com and stuff like this. And they bought into that, that story. And that's what, you know, that's what started this, this, uh, this thing in, in GameStop. It, yeah, it, it's actually like, it's the perfect storm. It's a wonderful story to know the ins and outs of how everything came together. And that Ryan Cohn was a very important catalyst that, that definitely sp- Bet up the entire thing, right? We see him joining in like December. And then by January, we see what ends up happening, right? But you have this like, you know, you have your champion, you have Keith Gill or Rory Kitty or the Buffing Value or whatever. Uh, that's mm-hmm. that's kind of like the face of this. And look how much money he makes some some huge bet. So then people get to criticize or, or cheer him on or whatever it might be. And, and his bet has been placed for well before then, like a year before. And then you have the stock's starting to go up and then you have Ryan Cohen and it helps kind of the news. And all of a sudden this guy's making tons of money from his really risky bet. And so that gives that more visibility. And then you add other people that kind of join into the fray and saying, Hey guys, like the stock is really heavily shorted. You realize that this is prime for a short squeeze. Right. And then, and then you factor in the fact that these big funds are starting to lose money. Now you all of a sudden have an adversary, right? Now it's like a good guy and a bad guy, dear David and Goliath. And so this story is getting really good and people just want to tune in to see who's going to win. And it feels good because there's resentment still from 2008. People had their Occupy Wall Street and then it never got anything out of it. And so now it's like, that's right. We're going to stick it to the man. <laughs> and then you have another hedge fund manager that's just like pours fuel on the fire without realizing it, you know, like right as, as, uh, uh, Gabe Blockin is is getting ready to bow out from his trade. You have Andrew Left that comes in and starts putting stuff on social networks and and and, and kind of like challenging Wall Street bets, poking the the hornet's nest, and so that just infuriates them and gets them even more more excited. And then you have some other you know individuals that come in there and say, "Hey guys, remember these Delta squeezes we were doing last year? Why don't we do it with this one? This is this is sophisticated options." Uh, arbitrage and, and that you know loosely related to a gamma squeeze and and they're like yeah all we need to do is do this with the options and then that's going to happen next and then next thing you know the news gets a hold of this right and and what happens after that is every participant that is in the stock you know that, that is involved with GameStop every single one of them is obligated to purchase shares short sellers have to buy the shares to close out their losing position the put options market makers you know the ones that are selling the the, the options writers are having to to buy their shares to close out their short hedge the call option writers are having to buy more shares because they need to increase their you know the, the delta hedge uh, because they're, you know, indifferent to this thing. Obviously, Wall Street bets is just buying the crap out of it because, like, they just want the stock to go to the moon. Everyone's buying this thing, and so we got to see this this catastrophic effect, uh, which, you know, not catastrophic, I guess, astronomical effect uh, that that just shot this price to the moon and eventually breaks the stock system. You know, like the brokers have to restrict because of these capital, these, these collateral requirement rules that were put in place in 2008. And so that gets kind of misunderstood. And then Elon Musk, and so then, that, then people get more enraged, right? Elon Musk starts tweeting about it. It's like, let the people trade. <laughs> you know, like the politicians are retweeting each other, Ted Cruz and, and AOC are agreeing on something. And it's like, everything just comes in together at once. It is a wonderful story. But yes, Ryan, Ryan Cohen played a pivotal role in sparking this entire thing. Yeah, it's really, I mean, 
that was a great overview of the, the, the story, really. And it's, it's no wonder it, it got so much traction. Um, it's quite fascinating to see, actually. It's really been an interesting couple of years. Um, and it, obviously, the cryptocurrencies have been really big on Wall Street bets as well. And what are your thoughts on how that sort of played out? Elon Musk's obviously involved a little bit on that side as well. So, you know, I'll, I'll speak to myself and then I'll talk about the, the bigger picture. Like I screwed up, you know, I, I, I was all about Bitcoin when it started. I'm like, this is a really great idea technologically, economically, you know, for the empowerment. I was also still kind of sour about the 2008. So I'm like bought into the ideology behind it and I started mining some and then naturally lost that particular wallet. But you know, but it was a very clunky, very unfriendly experience, like a not user friendly experience. Uh, and it didn't quite mesh in with Wall Street bets. It was just an experiment at its infancy. And then it starts getting adopted more and more. And then the price starts going up. People start talking about it. And I'm like, all right, cool. Congratulations, Bitcoin. You made it. I'm really proud of you. And that was that. I was like, every time that I saw any type of coin, I'm just like, well, that's just another coin. And, and they're taking about it different ways. And I didn't realize it but under my nose, like this entire ecosystem was being developed, which is what I'm now calling DeFi, which I still think it's like pigeonholing it too much. <laughs> like It's so big. And it is not coins. Coins are cool too. Don't get me wrong. I still like those. But this is like a system with which you can interact and with finances. Like, And if the goal is to democratize and to arbitrage and to empower yourselves and to do all these different things, DeFi and and blockchain technology allows people to do that in unimaginable ways. You know, if you like the stocks and you want to buy stocks, like you can now do that on crypto. Uh, you can buy synthetic stocks or actually tokenized stocks, which are collateralized by the underlying, whatever it is. There's different mechanisms, but the same difference for people to just want to put money into a, a thing that they think is going to make more money. Uh, and, and that's just the start of it, right? Like it is such a massive thing that I think that invariably these two worlds are colliding. It starts off as Bitcoin and then and then stocks, right? And then, then you have multiple coins and then you still have stocks. And then you have this DeFi system and they're kind of inching towards each other and they're overlapping. You know, you see things like Bitcoin futures trading on the CBOE or Bitcoin, sorry, crypto companies going public on the, on the NASDAQ. And then you have things that are going into the crypto, right? Let's tokenize different assets like metals and stocks and equities, whatever it might be. Uh, and in the not too distant future, they're going to be one and the same thing. You know, the, the one thing is that crypto has come a really long ways as far as the user experience, but it's still not there yet. You still have to do lots of clicking and lots of configuring and a lot of different, and so, and so but, but that's going to get fixed, you know? And, and once that's done, it's going to be all one and the same thing. We hope you're enjoying the episode. For interviews like this every Thursday, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, make sure you give us a star rating and leave guest suggestions along with any other feedback in the review section. Now, back to the show. Well, it's a great time to, uh, I think, talk about your uh, Wall Street Bets D app, which is one of the new things you, you, you started, um, which is completely involved in this DeFi space. Can you tell us about it? And I mean, I've been looking into it. There's a lot of stuff that is associated with it, different things that I'd love to talk through uh, with you. But it'd be great if you give us an overview, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so Wall Street, so WSB DAP, uh, just like on wallstreetbets.net, it's uh, basically, basically we're building this parallel ecosystem uh, to, to work with or alongside or interconnect with traditional finance, right? So because there's, because we, it's obvious that these things are kind of heading towards each other. We're spearheading this move. And, and is pushing forward the ability for people to further empower themselves and further democratization and increase the access to things and, and, and find new innovative ways of either finding inefficiencies for, for short-term profit and or creating new tools that, that may not have existed, but now possible to blockchain. So what we're currently doing is like you have, it's a DAO. This is like this decentralized organization. People buy WSB tokens, and then they become part of the governance. They can decide on on what what we're doing and how we're going to spend uh, money and, and et cetera, uh, and, and developing all sorts of tools. And so synthetic stocks is something that's already available. These are assets that are, you know, these are, these are tokens that mirror the price of uh, underlying shares of particular companies that have advantages of being 24-7, you know, no KYC, it's around the world, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it's got the disadvantages of it. It doesn't actually participate directly with the market. So you don't get your dividends, your voting rights. You don't get to actually 
have an influence in the price of the, the stock, which I believe is an important component of the market participation. But we're also getting close to introducing these tokenized versions of them where, where you do actually buy the stock. We're, we're creating another one is like ETPs. These are like ETFs, um, exchange traded portfolios, they're baskets of, of collections. So you can have mixed crypto with stocks and you can put like stocks from Korea and you can put stocks from the US and then you can put a couple of crypto coins in there and then you can put like metals in there and wrap them up into one ticker symbol and then just people can buy that. You know, the, the, the flexibility that the blockchain offers is something that you cannot do on uh, with regular ETFs. They have to do so much stuff to, to configure and to change and to reweight these things on the blockchain all through smart contracts is automated. Like, and I'm really excited about like doing, keep reading about how Nancy Pelosi has the best investment track record ever. In fact, I don't know if it's true yet or not, but I saw this tweet and I, I need the research before I parrot it, but, but whatever, I'll say what it said anyway. It said, if you had to put money into you know, the following things 10 years ago, this is how much money you would have made. And I stopped after the second line and then I just retweeted it, which was like, if you invested in Nancy Pelosi's fund, you would have made two point something million. Uh, you know, if you'd invested in Bitcoin, you would have made 1.9 something or another, you know, like, oh no, so yeah, million percent. Like, you know, it's, it's a huge, so, so Nancy Pelosi actually beat Bitcoin, which is cool, right? Crazy. So why not create like an ETP, this automated smart contract that rebalances itself whenever the sheet discloses a new position. <laughs> and, and then people just buy that thing, right? Like, and, and it feeds into the ethos of you can't beat them, join them. It's like sheds light on the absurdity that these these <laughs> congressmen and women are, are such incredible, <laughs> such incredible investors because they obviously have edge, right? But like, <laughs> uh, but anyway, so that that's the kind of stuff we have just released NFTs to try and kind of enhance the entire experience so people can buy the NFTs and they have better, you know, prices, they have better, higher yields. We're creating events for people that, that own it because the community is the, the most important part. Like we're throwing a party here in Miami in a couple of, uh, you know, like a month or so uh, to be able to, to, I don't know, just all sorts of different aspects of it. So just blending everything crypto, celebrating everything finance. And, and that's, that's what we're doing. Awesome. And so one of the main benefits of this Wall Street bets uh, D app is, um, I assume, is like lower cost. Because is that one of the things that you were sort of on about? Is that all the all these financial institutions basically try and charge you left, right, and center? Well, that's what they have been doing for, for years. Yeah, you know, like it's it's kind of tricky, right? So you know, if, I, if I'm being brutally honest, it's yeah, there's no commissions, right? You're just doing everything on the blockchain, but but blockchain's not free, right? <laughs> like you're paying money into gas fees or whatever it is. So there's there's opportunities where things can be cheaper, depending. You're know, trying to be on on uh, multiple networks. Some networks like Ethereum are expensive. Some other ones like Binance are cheaper. And trying to just mix and match different rules to try and create things that are actually uh, cheaper per se, right? Like the, the that don't cost. I mean, yeah, there's no commissions. You might pay the gas fees, but there's other opportunities there too, right? You have the transparency, everything, the decentralized nature of it prevents the ability for anyone to shut it down, right? Like the way what we saw in GameStop once the heat of the moment was taking place. You have very interesting ARB opportunities. You have stocks that are trading 24 hours a day and you have the other ones that aren't. Some people can take advantage of after hours news and, and, uh, and make that type of profit, right? Eventually closing that ARB opportunity, but that's like the best thing that can happen to a market. So it's giving us that stability. You also like the self-custodial aspect of it. You know, brokers don't, um, you know, you don't, have, you don't own those stocks when when you buy it on Robinhood. Robinhood does, which is fine. Like they kind of like a proxy and that's the way all brokers work. Uh, with, with the blockchain, it's like, no, you can actually be the self-custodial because brokers do have that counterparty risk. Brokers do actually run out of, like go out of business. <laughs> Robinhood came insanely close to doing that. Like people don't realize what tidal wave would have happened if they didn't come up with $3 billion overnight. But those risks are there. And so it eliminates some of those risks, which uh, which is good. We've, you know, So there, there's a lot of benefits to working with the blockchain. You have to replace Wall Street. You just work alongside of it. People have their Robinhood and their their crypto because some of the things just straight up are not available on on the, the what is it, the trade fire and traditional finance. Mm -hmm. And how do this, the smart contracts work for these exchange traded portfolios. I mean, you gave the example of uh, Nancy Pelosi. So it, will there be some, some sort of data feed that's connected to that knows when stock changes happen in some other portfolio? Yeah. So like the good thing is that there's so many people that are so smart. They've been working on this forever. 
that we're working with technologies that have already been tried and true. Like we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. So, you know, for things like the Oracle and mimicking stuff or just being able to validate data, right? You have um, Mirror, Terra, we have a partnership with them. And that's also what we use for our synthetic stocks. We've just announced a, a partnership with Balancers, the ones that are handling the, the, the ETPs, right? They have this, they've been working on forever this, the entire mechanism by which they can, with one, one swift transaction, actually put all the assets together. So we just daisy chains, uh, proven technology that's that's been really good. What we're doing, yeah, we're working with kind of the, the leaders and whatever kind of technology we're trying to, to mimic. And since that's already there and it's all interconnectable and compatible, then we just plug it all together. We tie it up in a nice knot and we put it out there for people to use. Yeah. And how does it work with um, buyers and sellers? Do you have to have enough sort of liquidity and volume in there for it to work? I, I don't understand the. Uh, yeah. It depends on depends on which, you know. Now we're getting technical, which I don't, I don't mind, but you know, it depends on what it is that you're trying to do, right? So, um, let's say for example, you're trying to do a synthetic stock, and so this is once again, this is like it's essentially a prediction market. You have people that come to the table and say, "Hey, I bet you that Apple's going to go down." The other guy says, "No, I'll bet you Apple's going to go up." And then they look at the price of Apple and say, "Okay, we'll use this as our kind of starting point, and I'll wish you luck." Then, depending on what happens to the price, uh, one person is going to have to pay the other person the difference, and and then they close that out. Right? The concept's relatively simple. You throw in some some uh, decentralized component to it, so that you actually have lots of people on one side, lots of people on the other side, and you do have to have that liquidity on on both sides. And so, for that particular uh, tool, this the synthetic stock, or what we're calling stonks, then we're adding these these stocks ticker by tickle based off of what the community wants. So the community wants to add Robinhood, you know, people like, oh, you know, we, we need a certain threshold, then we, we're able to add that because we can make sure that there's enough liquidity. For other stocks, right, the, these other ones that are kind of minted on the fly, we just released a, a macro hedge ETP, which is uh, anything but a YOLO. It's actually like this inflation busting now that we have everyone worried about these macro level events, uh, not just inflation, but you know, you get China, this, that, the other. This is a place where you can park your money and it won't lose its purchasing power and or um, value. It's somewhat of a it's more stable than some of these stable coins. This thing goes out there and it purchases underlying, which is some dollar currency, some gold, and some euro. I forget all the things that are inside of it, uh, but it mints it on the fly. So you go in there and you say, hey, I have, you know, I want to buy one unit of this thing. Here's my USDC or ETH or whatever it is. And then the system goes out and purchases all the underlying, wraps it up and gives it to you. The liquidity is already there for all the underlines. There's no illiquid assets that are wrapped up into the one. If you're talking about tokenized stocks, right? Similar thing. I give you my money, right? You do have to kind of pre-establish what demand has to be there so you can populate the drop downs and things like that. But then, then you have your, your intermediary go out, purchase the stock with the money that you just deposited, yeah. right? And then you link those two things together. So liquidity is there necessary for some stuff, not other stuff. Liquidity is always great, regardless of which one it is, because it just helps uh, get more competitive prices. It attracts ARB, uh, you know, the bots that go in there and scalp everything until everything is is uh, uniform across all, all mediums. And so, yeah, liqu- liquidity is a good thing on any anything, any market, any any time you want to buy or sell anything. It's so interesting how the space is is evolving, and. Um... Something else, so yeah, the high yield APY liquidity pools, um, which is another DeFi aspect. Can you can you sort of explain that and how it works and you know how people use them? Yeah, so you know, like I, I started this journey not knowing what anything is, right? <laughs> what yeah. the world is <laughs> yield sticking, farming, whatever. Why do you keep picking weird words like that? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's kind of a cool concept. Like these DeFi people keep innovating stuff. It's a way to make more money from the money that you have. You take it, and it serves a productive purpose of providing liquidity. Since we've established liquidity is good, uh, we have, like I said, the governance token, the WSB governance token, and we wanted to make it liquid so that people were able to buy it and sell it, and you know, make it useful. The way that th- there's two. There's two main approaches to per- to creating markets. The traditional one that you see in centralized or traditional finance is uh, you have your order book, you have buyers and sellers. You say, I want to buy at this price, or I want to sell at that price, or I want to buy at any price, or I want to sell at any price. And once you combine those four order types, you have what's, you know, just looks like an order flow and an order book, and you can get uh, you get those mechanics, but you need to have people on both sides at all times in order to have 
fluid looking movements. And DeFi introduced this other really smart approach to things called like automated market makers. Uh, you know, you, you do away with these order types. You, you literally just can buy or sell. And the way it works is you have tons of people that go in there and say, hey, I have uh, lots of BNB and I have a lot of WSB. I'm not going to use it. Uh, I'm bullish on both of them or whatever. Just deposit it. You put it into these automated um, market makers, these liquidity pools. You, you just the click of the button without a commitment. You can remove it whenever you want. So that money is there and it's 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 sitting in a smart contract for other people that say, oh, cool. I found out about Wall Street bets. I want to buy some. And they'll go to the market. They'll try to purchase some. And then you'll actually purchase it from the people that, that deposited it there. And then if somebody says, oh, okay, now I want to sell mine, then you sell it back to the people that you bought it to. And it's just this really smart, automated, decentralized, distributed uh, form of creating the market. And then the incentive you give to these people is you give them rewards. You give them, you know, some some WSB coins or well, in our case, we just get WSB coins as, as rewards. So it's it's a way to kind of create yield on on your tokens you're not using. And who who is paying that yield? The is it just because it the market maker is there some fee that's taken on transactions or no. So this farming and yield stuff, like it's typically biggest when uh, the coins start, like when you launch a coin, you need to do all sorts of things to try and promote its its uh, growth. And when the coin first launches, there's technically no real liquidity anywhere. And you have to try and really quickly figure out a way to, to get people to participate. So you reward them a lot at the beginning. Say, hey, hey, buy your coins and put them in here right away. And then as months go by, the rewards we'll give you will be diminishing because by then the market's going to going to be organically growing to the point where it's not necessary. Uh, and so as part of this kind of roadmap, the project designs, all the tokenomics is what they call it. And so you'll say, okay, well, we're going to have a billion tokens, right? And right off the bat, we'll make a hundred million of, of them available for people to purchase them. And so as the, the, you know, the smart contracts will take care of this, they take 100 million of those things, they put them into the, some of these automated pools, or maybe they'll set aside for some centralized exchanges, which also exists. Like we're, we're operating on BitMart and on ProBit, right? So we put some, you know, we, we put some tokens in those so that anyone that wants to do a market buy or whatever, they can just hit the buy button. Those things are available. Uh, so they're coming out of the, the, the pool of existing tokens that are out there. As the project matures, these rewards start going down uh, as they're not necessary for promoting the growth of this thing. But the, this thing kind of feeds itself, right? It's like self, uh, self-propagating. self And you mentioned NFTs earlier. Um, before like diving in a bit more on the Diamond Hand NFTs that you, you sort of created, what's your view on NFTs as a thing in the space? Like, it's, Obviously, this is a really highly talked about uh, thing at the moment. Um, what's your viewpoint on it? Where do you think it's going? So I decided not to make the same mistake that I did with Bitcoin, which was just to like skim the news <laughs> and, and then miss this entire thing that was taking place. So I'm looking at all these news bits and tweets about NFTs. And so I'm like, yeah, I'm not skimming these anymore. I'm, I'm not taking, I'm diving into the water uh, bef- before I form an opinion, right? Because there's obviously, it's easy to say, well, somebody just bought a picture of a rock for millions of dollars and that's just some tulip mania hype or whatever. It's It's natural to... Uh, knee jerk your way into that position, but like, and there's definitely some of that. Don't get me wrong, but they're the, NFTs are cool, right? Like they're still not defined yet. Right now, NFTs are unfortunately just defined as yeah, you, you buy artwork from the original guy or whatever, and then you can prove custody, you know, and, and they're valuable because if you think of a Picasso or whatever, you know, like you know that the certificate of authenticity is there. But when you look at these NFTs, there's not Picasso, right? Like these are like <laughs> pixelated pieces of crap. Like they're nothing to do with artwork. I mean, some of them do. I, I don't want to minimize them. There's some really beautiful, really creative, really innovative computer generated artwork, which is nice, right? But but let's just be real with ourselves. It's not necessarily what's driving this craze right now, especially some of these most popular. You know, I see the toads today are just selling for gazillions of, you know, it's tons of money and they're pixelated. They're just, anyone can do that. But what they're creating is very special, which is these kind of communities and it's defining different ways of creating utility. You know, it's it's making evident that this generation also has a separate set of value systems. You know, maybe they'll say, well, I could buy a car or I could buy this instead and I'm going to derive the same amount of pleasure from it because I don't plan on selling it. And that's what makes some of these prices go up like crazy. 
And then you have other ones like the Board Ape Yacht Club, which I'm jealous of because they get to define what happens next yeah. in, in the space, right? Or at least they can really push it in a certain direction. You have these these apes that are going for half a million dollars or more. I saw one this morning that went for one and a half million dollars. Mm-hmm. But people that buy that, it's like, yeah, I'm not going to sell. They have life-changing money, right? And they're like, yeah, I'd prefer to just have this instead of something else. And the creators of this thing are doing really neat things to try and promote this kind of belo- this community for which you can purchase a membership for a, you know astronomical amounts of money. But they got like a store where only members of the, the club get to buy stuff from and they'll sell out instantly. You know, they'll you know, I heard that they're they're creating a, a yacht party for for members, and you know they have the flex, they have the the luxury to do that because these things are so expensive that the royalties generate enough money. But even still, like even if you don't have your half million dollar NFTs, like you have just rel- more accessible ones, they can do similar things to say, hey, you know, going back to this tribal concept that we spoke about earlier, it's like you know people like to belong, and like yeah, this is what brings us in common, and maybe it's the artwork. Maybe it's the philosophy or the team or the people, or maybe it's because we want to create a game, right? Loot, which is like an NFT of just words. They're like, all right, let's buy these words. It's literally just black and white uh, things that are spelled out. They're like, we'll, you know, we'll make a game out of it. And, and these things are also going for tons of money because this particular community obviously probably likes gaming and obviously probably knows about programming. And so the infrastructure for creating, um, open source crowd uh, software that, that that combines people, it'll probably get really cool game out of it. Right. And, and, and a really cool club. So, so that's what we're at. That's what's actually behind this thing. It's like, the, it's easy to just stick to the headlines, just like it is with Bitcoin. Oh, look, it's made to, you know, Bitcoin is, I remember when Bitcoin went over $2,000, now more expensive than gold, you know, and whatever. And it's like, yeah, okay, low-hanging fruit, but there's more to it. People people are actually enjoying these things. Some of them are hoping to make money. Certainly right now, it's relatively easy to make money. I don't think that's going to be the case uh, forever. But but even once this mania settles down, there's some serious staying power in the form of saying, this is an identity, this is a pass to a club, or this is a piece of war- artwork that's that there too, right? The technology does allow you to have your Picasso or your song or whatever, and things that we probably haven't yet thought up with, you know, how do you actually create an actual identity, right? How do you verify your single identity you and sign things to, to get into places or, or more sophisticated tokenization of uh, real estate and fractionalizing real estate and all, all sorts of really cool applications that we're yet to see the full spectrum of. Yeah, I think it's, so interesting um, the development of these community yeah but like clubs is probably a good a good way of uh, saying it like you said um, it's starting to make more sense to me as you know I sort of envisage it not just as you know speculation it is entry to these clubs and you know like you said the little bit the art sort of element as well you know something interesting happened like when I decided to dive into this thing I sent out a tweet I'm sitting out in my car waiting for my wife to get out of the grocery store I'm like all right thinking about doing NFTs what do I do and I got overwhelming flood of people saying it's just excitement and yeah check this one out check that one out I'm like gee like i got more likes and retweets and comments on that thing that i'd seen in a long time it's like okay so clearly i've struck a nerve here this is impression number one like lots of energy here that's cool and then and then people gave me a ton of nfts i'm like oh these are cool thank you so much right and eventually i put them for sale and it would sell for ridiculous amounts of money well for what i consider to be a jpeg right like you know one eighth one and a half eighth i'm like okay but then I purchased one. I actually, you know, took my money and I <laughs> gave it over and then I got an NFT in return. And I got this feeling that I did not have with the other ones that were gifted to me, regardless of, of which projects they happened to be. I was like, I own this thing, right? And and it's expensive, right? It spent like a yeah. thousand bucks or three thousand bucks or whatever it might have been on this thing. And then I, then I lost that itch to try and want to sell it. You know, I'll check in the price. Obviously, everyone's like obsessed with the floor, which is a stupid metric, but whatever. Uh, but I'm buying into it, right? I'm also checking the floor, <laughs> but, but I don't want to sell it anymore, you know? And it's this kind of this irrational thing where I stop and say, what do you mean you don't want to sell this JPEG for $3,000? Like you're just super happy about this VR headset that you bought for like three or 400 bucks. And I, st- I stayed at the store half an hour considering the gigabytes and how many things and whether the extra 50 bucks were worth it. And, 
you know, but, he, but, but now I have a picture that's worth so much more, 10 of these VR goggles and <laughs> like, and, and I'm actually deriving pleasure from owning it. Right. So it, there is a transformation there, which I think is really cool. Yeah. And what a lot of people don't um, understand is the, all the extra benefits you get now, not from every uh, club, let's call it. Um, but they do, you, you were talking about the, um, the, the apes one and uh, there's another, you know, Stoner Cats, I think it was by Ashton Kutcher that has, you gets you access to their uh, animation series only for those people. And it's just, it's, it's very interesting, these things that are developing and you can see how it's becoming a club. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, we're still you know we're still waiting to see exactly what the models that the people want, and even once they're defined, like I still think they're ever changing because this thing allows it to happen. But yeah, there's a lot of really special creative ways of saying, all right, cool, let's make it. Yeah, sure, artwork or you know bragging status, but but let's also find ways to actually do cool things together. You know, so this that's cut your ones, or you have like the you know let's make a program or a game together. We're doing the same thing with the Wall Street Best Diamond Hands NFT that, that, you know, the public sale starts in the 22nd or 3rd, I think. Uh, Pre-sale tickets are available now. Uh, And you have all the artwork and you have, you know, we're appealing to all uh, the traditional NFT people. But we want to make this thing this kind of like an access pass, a VIP pass where you can have the same WSB experience. You're part of the same club over here and we're going to give you financial benefits, better, higher yield uh, rewardings, access to exclusive events. Maybe, maybe they're virtual or maybe they're in, in, in real life. Uh, you know, give you access to more additional future airdrops that are going to be coming in here and, and, and creating that sense of belongingness and actually utility behind the rewarding mechanisms behind being a part of this club. Mm. And just so uh, something I've only just sort of started to understand as well is, and maybe you could take us through it because you've done it, with diamond hand and NFTs um, is a computer generated aspect of it because obviously some, some are rarer than others. Um, and it's, you know, the, can you take us through that aspect of the computer generation element? And so, you know, there's X amount and then they make different variations of them. Yeah. So in order to, you know, a lot of these things uh, are computer generated. So we have 15,000 uh, diamond hands NFTs uh, after which we'll be dropping you know, free, free, a uh, bull, a bear, and an ape, all of which are unique 15,000 collections of it. And so you set up computer programming rules. So you have like an artist come in and design variations of it. So if we're talking about the hands and make the hands in different shapes and change the nail colors or put a tattoo on them or the diamond's going to shine bigger, it's a different color background or whatever it might be. Like you just put different attributes and then you assign those attributes uh, a percentage or a rarity, right? So you'll say like only X percent are allowed to have this ring and, you know, that large percentage will have that. And, and you, you configure this all so that you have this kind of, for the people that are collecting these things that, that have this sense of the rarity, it's like, wow. And, and what's cool about it is like, you don't know, not even the people that are creating this know what the combination is going to be. This is a rule-based thing. You create all the artwork, you put all the parameters, you set it all up. And then you just throw it into this kind of slot machine style where it spins the little wheels and they all just kind of land wherever they're supposed to land. And, and so we don't know what the rarest one is going to be or what it's going to look like. And that it's also this gamified enthusiasm component, which is fun too. But once you have all these NFTs, they, they all provide the same utility. So if you're in it for being part of the club and you want to go to the parties or whatever, then it doesn't matter which one you have. But then you have the collectors that say, no, no, I want to have the one with the you know, the one with the YOLO tattoo on it or the one with the, you know, red diamond as opposed to the white one. And, uh, and, and so you add that, that component of it to give people additional kind of collector appreciation to it. Just, just like any collection, baseball cards, like, yeah, but, you know, the Babe Ruth is probably going to be really rare and the other ones are probably going to be more common or whatever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, as you were talking about earlier, the, the space is still not super easy to get used to and understand how do you go about buying this stuff? Let's just talk about uh, the Diamond Hands NFTs as an example. How do you go about, what do you need? You know, how, what's the process? So you go to wsbcollectibles.io uh, or you go to wallstreetbest.net. I think I'm pretty sure it's linked directly to that. And I, I suppose that if you're a complete novice, you get, you're going to have to watch the, the video, which kind of helps you out with how to, uh, how to get into crypto, which is like how to download the app that allows you to buy and sell these things and, and how to kind of navigate at the most 
basic level how these things work. But if you have a wallet, you've done at least a crypto transaction and you're familiar with uh, with these Web 3.0 things, you have your wallet, you go to that, that website, you connect your website to the wallet with just a button and then you just approve that, that warning message. And then you click the mint button and they're, they're, they cost 0.1 ETH each uh, and you can mint multiple ones. I think there's a five limit, five uh, number limit for it. And that's all you need to do. And I guess the only relevant thing is uh, currently before October, I want to say it's 22nd or 23rd. I really should have this date memorized. Prior to that day, people are buying raffle tickets, right? These are kind of like pre-sale passes. They're a way to get around the high gas fees. Ethereum gas fees are astronomical. And so this is a creative, I've seen a lot of creative efforts to combat this and this is one so you buy the raffle ticket and uh depending and yeah depending on how many people buy the raffle tickets you have a really high pop probability of w- winning or at worst like a one in three chance in winning and so you have your raffle ticket you hold on to it on this 20 whatever of october you can then just burn your your pass and then you'll get in return for it either your Diamond Hands NFT, or you'll get a full refund for whatever you spent on it, right? So it's not like you're actually buying a lottery ticket where you're non-refundable. This is, it's fully refundable. And then after that, then I'm guessing people can also buy it secondhand on OpenSea or different markets. And you know that you're talking about the high uh, ETH fees and the gas fees. Um, You know, Solana, is that a way of getting around that? How does that work? Do you have to choose whether you put it on one or the other? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, um, so there's different protocols that, that created. So like there, you know, Bitcoin was good for, well, supposedly it was good for, for creating transactions and make this thing a currency yeah. for exchange of goods and services. Turns out that, uh, this thing probably outgrew the expectations of, um, the maker or makers of it. And there's bottlenecks and inefficiency. So then you have other ones that kind of come out like Ethereum and, and, and add on additional functionality like this smart contract capabilities and you have forks that go off them. And so then, and all of a sudden like, yeah, yeah, the gas fees are too high. The guy, the guys made this still good and much better, but still they didn't anticipate this is going to happen or that they were going to plug this thing into that thing this way. And so, so you have protocols like Solana and, uh, and several other ones that I can't remember of, which which solved that problem, right? Like on a, on a technical level that is a little above my pay grade, but I understand enough that the, the architecture behind it allows for these transactions to be much faster, much cheaper, and uh, much more efficient and catered towards this type of use for blockchain, right? Which might be more intelligent smart contracts, higher volume or whatever it could be. So if you want to use Bitcoin to do an NFT, which I'm, I was told they exist, I haven't seen any of them, but then you have to do certain stuff. If you want to buy ETH, uh, uh, NFTs, you have to do certain stuff. And if you want to buy Solana stuff, uh, NFTs, you have to do certain stuff. And that certain stuff implies go to a marketplace. So a popular one for ETH right now is OpenSea or Rarity. There's just websites like eBay, right? And they'll say, yeah, if you want to play here, you have to use ETH or Polygon or whatever. If you want to use Solana, yeah. there's a separate Solana-based e- marketplace for that, uh, right? Got you. So you can't, one marketplace can't do both ETH and no, Solana. not yet. Not that I know of. I, I yeah. know that it's technically possible yeah. to have NFTs bridge. Our NFT is going to be uh, compatible on multiple networks, right? Because we because that's the nature of what we're trying to do. Um, but as far as the marketplaces interacting with one uh, with one another, it's I haven't yet seen wide adoption. It's not easy, and in some cases, it kind of. Uh, uh, defeats the purpose of having everything on one network because if you have one thing talking to the other network, then you get the weakest link syndrome and, and then now, now you're forced to pay gas again. So we're going to see multiple protocols go out there. I'm excited for for what Coinbase is doing because going back, all the, yeah, I signed up for that thing because I saw a tweet like 1.3 million signed up for it. I'm like, wait, you can sign up for it? So like I'm driving back from taking my kids to school and on my phone, I'm like, I got to sign up for this thing. And I thought that the app was out already, but no, I'm, you know, I made 1.9 million. Like that's my place on in line, <laughs> but it's cool. And I'll tell you why I think it's cool that they're doing this. You know, I think what you will about centralized, whatever institutions or this one, that's like now part of Wall Street, whatever. Yeah. Criticize all you want. But one thing that they, they've been able to do is kind of bring the Robin Hood experience to crypto and people cannot underestimate how important that is. Because once people buy, they, you know, get their coin base, they keep hearing about NFTs, but they can't figure out how to connect their wallet to the stupid MetaMask and the thing, 
they could just get the app and with the app, they click on the button that says NFT and they can look and they can buy it and they put the credit card in and it's like all just a seamless experience. And now the people are on the hook because now they have this magical experience that I had when I purchased mine. Now they're looking at their thing all day long. They're checking their price or whatever it is they want to do, hanging out in the Discord. And next thing you know, they're like, wait, hold on. So you're telling me that there's not just Coinbase? What's OpenSea? And, and now they have the time and the interest and the motivation to actually learn about these more complicated interfaces or user experiences. And so, so it's like a gateway drug or a gateway experience, which I think is invaluable. So I'm, I'm really excited for what they're going to do to the NFT space. I do not think it's a competitor or a killer of any of these. I think it's going to be a massive like lead generator for them, right? It's going to bring in people that otherwise would not have done it into this space and people within that space. Some, some will stay on, on Coinbase forever, but they were never going to be in the other spaces anyways. But some of the people will go into Coinbase and then decide to go into these other spaces that might not have done it otherwise. So that is a very bullish thing for, for NFTs. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, they, they hold a lot of, a huge community. Like that, that power is, is incredible, really. It's the, the gateway to open up to the mass market, really. Yeah, and it's important. Yeah. Jamie, it's been, it's been amazing. Um, really enjoyed our chat. And, and thanks for um, going into so much detail on some things that, you know, that I didn't understand enough about. And it was great to get your insight on it, especially all the stuff that's happening at Wall Street Bets uh, on your side at the moment. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave with and say to, the, to our community? No, not, not at all. Thank you so much for having me. I, I really had uh, a good time with this. I love just talking and exploring about these different things. And if people are interested in following up on things that I said, they can go to either my Twitter account, which is like the verified Wall Street Bets account or at Wall Street Bets. Um, they can also go to wallstreetbets.net to see most of these things that I was making reference to. I had one last question actually as well. Um, what's your, if you could narrow it down to one thing. What's your Wall Street bet of today that you, you're most interested in? The Wall Street bet? Like, so what stock I'm most interested in? Well, like, of anything. Like, it's just, you know, these, these sort of things. I, you know, if, if I'm picking up... Uh, well, so if it's, if it's in... <laughs> I, the NFTs, I'm still doing my journey. So I don't yet have like the super fair. I'm st- I, I click first and ask questions later and I get burned. Like this morning, I got ripped off because I've been following this NFT that's supposed to launch tonight but they, they use different time cones like UTC and STTC. Uh, so I, I kind of missed out on that. And I got this message on my Discord saying, hey, this thing is ready to mint. And it, once again, I should drive and trade, but pull out my thing and I instantly buy it. And I was like, oh, cool. It's only 0.7 ga- dollars. And sorry, it's $7 for gas fees. This is like super cheap. I'm so great. Right. And then it's like, verify, okay, your, your ETH has been transferred. I'm like, what do you mean transferred? I, this, this was a transaction. This is not a transfer. And I'm like, and I click, I'm like, ah, these bastards fished me successfully, right? Like I went to the .net instead uh, of the dot .whatever. And well, you know, like, but it's, it's part of the learning process, right? Yeah, I won't make yeah. that mistake again. I've made other ones and I won't make those again. What my favorite thing is, pro- pro- I'm kind of getting excited about this stock called Any, uh, A-N-Y, which uh, is- Oh, like, I saw that today. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's kind of blending in this crypto with the renewable energy. It's got, it's got a nice little ring to a lot of different things. And so I got my eyes on that. Nice. Awesome, Jamie. Well, I'll, I'll let you be. And um, thanks again for all your information and all the great, great words. So. Yep. No, thank you very much for having me. This was great. Thanks for listening, everyone. Just a quick note before we sign off. If you're looking for an easily digestible daily update on the markets, this might be of interest. Opto Updates is our short newsletter sent every day during the trading week, giving you a bulleted list of the top seven stories from the global stock markets. We've done the hard work for you, highlighting relevant opportunities and trends. And in addition, we'll also keep you notified of any new products, stock reports, or webinars from the Opto world. If you're interested, sign up using the link in the show notes. And thanks also to CoFruition for consulting on and producing the show. Until next time. CoFruition.